Uh, howdy, folks. Uh, if you could take your seats, we'll start in a moment or so. Okay, folks, welcome. Uh, you, just to make sure you're in the right place, this is the Beyond SOPA panel, creating a pro-innovation, pro-artist copyright policy. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to see you here, and my name is Declan McCullough. I write about technology, law, public policy, including uh, privacy, copyright, uh, all that fun stuff for uh, CNET. I spent 10 years in Washington, D.C., and that was enough. I uh, finally escaped and uh, now live on the, uh, the West Coast in Silicon Valley. Uh, there's, uh, we don't have that much time today, and we have uh, folks on the panel who are, uh, have a lot to say, so I'm going to skip uh, bios, uh, skip prepared statements, skip PowerPoint presentations, and uh, go directly into a conversation. <laughs> uh, and that also will leave as much time as possible for you, uh, who know more about this uh, than most of us do, uh, to ask uh, these folks pointed questions. One thing you'll note uh, if you follow copyright policy is that there is a, a serious flaw in this panel, and that is everyone up here largely agrees. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. No, I'm the, from, a moder from a moderator's perspective and the audience's perspective, we want to see some sparks. We want actual disagreement. Uh, so what uh, CEA told me is that they extended an invitation to the Motion, Motion Picture Association of America and the Recording Industry uh, uh, Association of America saying, come on. Send uh, someone here, uh, and in both cases the answer was no. Uh, but we've got a, f a few empty chairs. I'm happy to haul up here. So if anyone in the audience, I'm not going to single you folks out because I because I know you're there, uh, wants to come up here and defend the views of uh, your employer, uh, then uh, no, no, no point, no, no. GG, we're not literally pointing fingers. Uh, uh, you, you'll, you'll be outnumbered, uh, but I'll, I'll do my best to give you some air cover. It's, it's better, though, if you actually believe the views of your employer. I like that. <laughs> Thank you, John Kerry. So uh, here, I don't actually see anyone from the audience who remain unnamed at Gigi uh, walking up here to take me up on the offer. So I'll do my best to uh, keep the conversation going and actually try to get these folks uh, to know, uh, stop singing Kumbaya, we won. Uh, the... So this is, uh, the, the purpose of the panel is to try to uh, figure out uh, this pro-innovation, pro-artist copyright policy. Uh, let, let's start with the obvious. Um, is, is SOPA, um, this is the Stop Online Piracy Act. Uh, this is what caused uh, 10 million plus internet users, depending on who, who, who you believe, uh, to rise up and say, uh, hell no, uh, let's not do this. So uh, the uh, law, uh, sorry, proposed law was pulled from consideration in the House and the Senate. We haven't seen it since, but we, there are some <coughs> hints that it might come back. Uh, afterwards, months <coughs> afterwards, uh, MPAA chief Christopher Dodd told The Hollywood Reporter he was, uh, quote, confident uh, that uh, the president was using his, uh, quote, good relationships to advance something like this. The White House subsequently released a paper calling for a, a new law targeting offshore websites. Uh, this, this sounds like it's something that's not completely dead. Uh, uh, Gigi, you're pretty close to this. Uh, uh, Gigi is, of course, uh, uh, famous in this uh, uh, realm, uh, but for folks who don't know, she runs uh, the group Public Knowledge, which I understand is not the same as the group Public Enemy. Uh, there's, uh, Gigi, is, are we going to see uh, 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 the son of SOPA? It's going to be called something different, but what do you think? What's your prediction? Absolutely, we will see the son of SOPA, and uh, the more controversial provisions of SOPA and PIPA will be stripped. Uh, and then the lot of us who oppose SOAP and PIPA will be told that we are unreasonable for opposing this new very reasonable bill. So expect it to happen. It's already in the works. But my feeling is the best defense for those of us who believe in an open and free internet, uh, the best defense is an offense. And I think we have a huge opportunity in light of what happened a year ago, although it does seem like light years ago, to push for some affirmative copyright reform, and I think everything is on the table, including copyright terms, uh, and make the other side explain why we shouldn't bring balance back to copyright. It's kind of like the previous debate about patents. Let's put it to uh, those that want greater and stronger and longer copyright enforcement 
and put it to them, why shouldn't we have some balance? Why shouldn't we turn the clock back to the original purpose of copyright? So yes, it will be back, but I think this is the year that we push our own affirmative agenda and make the other side go on the defensive a bit. Now, how about a question for Wilson, uh, who, who is the co-director of uh, Fight for the Future, which uh, led a, uh, a, a, or uh, helped organize a petition against SOPA, advocacy against SOPA, and uh, did well, but you folks also uh, had a petition and advocacy against uh, a, a cybersecurity bill uh, called CISPA, uh, and uh, the, uh, Representative Jared Polis, a Colorado Democrat, and some Republicans said the same thing, that CISPA would waive every single privacy law ever enacted in the name of cybersecurity. Uh, the problem you had is that uh, tech firms liked what you were saying uh, and supported you. There's this nice uh, advocacy group and, and Silicon Valley alliance on SOPA, and you won. Uh, and on cybersecurity, the alliance fragmented. You had most, but not all, Silicon Valley companies saying, yeah, this is not great, but it, well, we like it, and we'll, and we'll send the House committee a letter su supporting it, and uh, you lost. Uh, the bill passed the House uh, 248 to 168. Uh, so wh what's your uh, predictions about the future of advocacy when you can't get companies to sign on? Um, well, it's important to note we did end up stopping it in the Senate. Um, well, for now. And Yeah, um, but I think, I think the Privacy and copyright are really different issues. Um, even on the, I mean, honestly, for us, the hard part wasn't wasn't not having those those uh, large corporate allies. The hard part was that I think people there's a different level of public interest in privacy, where I think you have a broader number of people professing, you know, saying it's something they really care about when it comes to their life online. But at the same time, I think it just hasn't really been fought over as much as copyright. And I think there's there is a when, going into SOPA, we had a bunch of people who are really primed to see this step by the MPA as a huge overreach who've been following, you know, for years they'd seen their, their uh, favorite services come under attack, come under threat, and, and really, you know, didn't want to give any more ground. Whereas I think with, with privacy, it's always the kind of thing where it's hard to give people a feeling that it could affect them. Whereas with SOPA, they could see it. They could, they could you know, picture sites that they use every day that could just disappear if, if you know, we lost Safe Harbor. Um, so it's hard to make it visceral. That was really the challenge for us. And I think late in the game, we started succeeding. And we made this site, um, uh, doyouhaveasecret.org, which really tried to kind of capture the creepiness of uh, a state of affairs where the government has access to all of your, your personal communications. And you know, that's not the only way to do it. But, but something along those lines, I think we can, um, we can provoke a, a significant public response. And the other cool thing about privacy is that members of Congress are used to getting far fewer phone calls from, from people. Um, so you, um, you know, we were able to, to, to mobilize a fraction of the number of people on, on the Senate version of CISPA as we did on SOPA, but at the same time it was felt. It was a big deal. And we're not sure if it tipped the scales in that case, but it was close enough that it could have. Well, let me um, ask another panelist um, what he has to think. Uh, and that panelist is, is Derek sitting at the end. Now, D Derek uh, has a badge saying that, um, which is a lie, it says that he works for the Republican uh, study. Uh, committee, uh, but he no longer does. Uh, why he doesn't is uh, a longer story, uh, um, and maybe he can elaborate. No uh, comment. But, uh, did, well, hold on, we'll, 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 we'll try again. But, but he, came, he came out with a report that, so, so, see, you're laughing. You, 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 folks in the audience know, uh, uh, last month, uh, saying that uh, um, some excerpts, copyright violates nearly every tenet of laissez-faire laissez capitalism. Another warns that today's legal system is, quote, seen by many as a form of corporate welfare that hurts innovation and, hurt, and hurts the consumer. Uh, so, uh, Derek, is there, is there a chance that, that Republicans uh, too often have, uh, you know, said, well, copyright, uh, co rights are rights. Um, this is intellectual property is property. We like property rights. We're Republicans. Uh, and. Uh, um, but is another way to phrase this, well, it's more like a regulatory regime created by Congress that can lead to regulatory capture, and all you good Republicans know from reading George Mason University's papers on public choice theory, that sometimes you might have regulations where the cost exceeds the benefits. Is, is, there, a, is there a chance that Republicans are going to stop uh, say, uh, saying we, we love expanding property rights and copyright? Absolutely. <laughs> and how is that? How, how is that going to happen? You had a paper that came out this week from, from Cato, but you're not working for Cato uh, full time. It's just a paper, right? Yes. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the memo was talking, the report for the RRC 
uh, was very clearly looking at it as a regulatory scheme. This is a congressional created instrument in order to maximize content creation, which is why we can look at it from a cost benefit analysis and say, are we actually ma maximizing content creation? Is there actually an author who says, well, I'm, I probably am not going to write that book if I only get earnings for my entire life and then my children get earnings for 50 years, but I would write the book if I made money forever and then my children made money for 70 years or 90 years, which is the type of argument you have to make to justify our current copyright system. And in the Cato piece, it went into a little bit more depth as far as the property rights angle. Uh, also with TechDirt, I, I went into this a little bit too, but it really, it's not a conventional property right. Uh, and, and almost every conservative organization's come out after the memo. There hasn't been a single conservative organization that's come out opposed to copyright reform after the memo. And everyone that's come out in favor of copyright reform has kind of made this underlying argument that intellectual property is actually different from tangible property uh, for a variety of reasons. And not the least of which is the Constitution very clearly says that it has to be for a limited period of time, whereas most property you can have forever. Uh, John Perry Barlow, you're uh, the, the co-founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, although now you're working in uh, algae biotech startups. I don't really understand, but let's put, put that aside. <laughs> and uh, you, you're a former Republican, what, uh, like a, you're a county Republican chairman? Is it yeah, state Republican chairman? I was, Republican I was chairman? a state uh, Republican commission. I was uh, one of Dick Cheney's campaign managers when he first ran for office. So, no, uh, but And I cannot, and I'm not a Republican at present. Uh, I got I got schooled on that over the last decade or so, but you know it it does cause me a great deal of good to to hear that the Republican Study Committee recognizes something I've been saying since 1990 in public and had been thinking a lot longer than that, which is that there there is a big difference between a song and a toaster, and uh, that treating songs as though they were no different from toasters is absolutely not the right way to monetize human uh, creativity. It gets in the way of it. And I know that from my own experiences with the, the Grateful Dead, uh, where we based everything on viral marketing, uh, that it's just simply impractical, unless, of course, you're a large institution who pirates the creative work of artists and holds that as, as your property for a century or so while you reap huge profits from it. Now, it, copyright at, at the moment has been serving very well to do that. And I don't think, you know, I, what part of me is still Republican believes that what you want in economy is efficiency. This is not economic efficiency. This, this retards the process of creation, and I can't see any good argument to the contrary. So, Hank, uh, you're, uh, we, uh, uh, you're up here because, well, first, you're a regular at, at, at CES. I think I, uh, I've moderated you on a panel at least once before, probably in this very room. Uh, but you, you were involved uh, in the, uh, the uh, rap uh, group uh, Public Enemy, which is not public citizen and not public knowledge. And uh, in, uh, in fact, I think some of your music is being played this, e this evening. Is that right? That's good. Um, anyway, uh, there's, uh, what, 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 from an artist's perspective, what, what do you think? Has Congress gone, gone off the rails? Uh, is, or is, is SOPA generally the right approach, but uh, some of the, the wording was wrong? What's gonna, what, what do you want to see, uh, if, if anything? Maybe status quo is fine. I don't want to see anything happen. I just, I just think, that, I think that we have laws that are put in place to remedy any kind of infringement, you can go, to, you can sue somebody and take them to court. And I think that that's, to me, is sufficient enough. I think that anything else is now is overreaching. Now we're getting into a, into a state where John said it's, it's, it's now prohibiting, you know, creativity. Because now we're, we're asking, we're asking to, 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 to basically, you know, stop things before they even happen. You know, and I think that that's, you know, that's just my take on it. So, and so, uh, status quo for you would would be fine, and or do, do we, or is it actually roll back some of the existing laws? 
course you should roll back. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think, of course it should be rolled back. But, but I, as to me, as, as, as it stands right now, it's, it's better than moving forward. You know, so, you know, I guess, you know, I would love to see it move back, yes. If that's then let, let me uh, ask uh, Mike. Uh, Mike Masnick is um, uh, uh, the uh, head of uh, TechDirt, of course, and he uh, this is probably the best place to find arguments for where to push back on copyright. Uh, is, is, there, is, is this time for a counterattack? Uh, you, you can imagine some ways this could be done. Uh, you know, you get fines for uh, frivolous takedown notices, uh, shortening copyright terms, uh, expanding fair use uh, legislatively, uh, uh, amending some of the anti-circumvention sections of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Is, is 2013 a counterattack? Kumbaya. About all the wonderful things that, that happen. You have to admit that there are a ton of problems out there, um, thanks to existing copyright law, that, that all really um, should be on the table to be fixed. And, and the more that we can do to show where those problems are, and the fact that um, the DOJ and ICE are still out there seizing websites on very questionable rationale, um, they're throwing people in jail on questionable rationale. They're um, doing all of these things that we were told were going to be the problem that came out of SOPA, and yet they're already happening. Um, I think, you know, to the extent that the, the victory against SOPA was an Im important one um, in, in acting as a landmark, people sort of missed the fact that much of the, the, the stuff that we were really scared of was going to happen is happening anyways. And so, you know, the more that we push back against that and highlight where that's happening, and that there are a lot of problems, it's not, it's, there's not a single thing that, you know, that, oh, if we fix this, we're going to fix all the problems. Um, so, it's on. It's on. It's kind of cutting out. Hello? Hello? <laughs> I can just yell? <laughs> it's on. Okay. Uh, now I can hear myself, too. Wow. All right. Uh, but, but basically, there, there are a ton of problems. And yes, you know, I think that it would be really, it's really important to take the momentum of what did happen with SOPA and try and do whatever we can to use that to push back at, at all, the, all the different problems. And uh, Gigi, you want to talk about pushing back. I mean, you're, you're in D.C. Mike and I are on the West Coast. Uh, and you, you might have a better idea of what this means. Uh, we're, we're, maybe you can uh, a lot, um, uh, sign up with the Republicans and get a cost-benefit analysis for every new copyright regulation. What do you think? I love that idea. But I, I want to just really quickly tick off things that I think are on the table as far as copyright reform are concerned. And also, encourage people to go to the internetblueprint.org, which is sort of our copyright reform agenda. So copyright terms on the table. DMCA reform, both the anti-circumvention provisions that prohibit you from ripping a DVD to your iPod, and also the 512, that's the copyright of the abuse of the notice and takedown system is really horrible, and that's this been documented. Said, you know. Yeah, fair use reform, why shouldn't your personal non-commercial uses be fair use? Why should they be actionable? Uh, digital first sale, why shouldn't you own your digital, your digital goods? It's not clear that when you die, who owns your iTunes? Statutory damages reform. I mean, that's a, we talked about that in the patents, but, you know, damages. But statutory damages, that's what chills innovation. Because people can just threaten litigation, copyright litigation, and new innovators fold. Domain name seizures, clearly. Um, and another big one is somebody has got to reform trade policy and the U.S. trade representative because they are completely off the rails when it comes to including uh, intellectual property provisions in trade agreements. And let's not cheer that we beat back SOAP and PIPA because let me tell you something, right now in the Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership Agreement, they're negotiating the same exact provisions that we beat back in international trade agreements. And what they do is what the content does is what they don't get what they want here, and there's history, they go overseas and they get it, and then they come back and they say, oh gee, we signed this treaty, oh gee, we signed this trade agreement, so now we have to pass the same laws here to make sure that we're consistent uh, with what we've signed overseas. So 
Uh, nobody should be having any victory parties while the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement is being negotiated. So that's my preliminary list, and I've got more of, of things we, can, we should and can do. And all this rolls back over into freedom of speech as well. So you guys have to understand that this is not just about copyrights for, for musical content, but it also revolves everything. You know, so I'm starting to see videos being pulled down from, you know, from YouTube because of copyright infringements, <coughs> because of someone's uh, voice has been used. Yeah. And, and who knows who have the legal claims of somebody's voice or not. You, you, whether you even signed a contract or not with anybody, it's, it's all, none of that stuff seems to matter. And I think that the things that we have to, you know, whether you're, you're into it deeply or you're into it very shallowly, we, we, also, we always have to understand that we all have to fight for these rights because if, if, these, if, if they're taking one thing away, then they're, they're using that one thing as a, as a weapon against other things. Like so you, you can't own free speech. You can make a service out of free speech, but you can't own it. Uh, because if you can own it, then you can control it and you can stop it. And I want to reinforce what Gigi just said about the TPP and, and ACTA. This reminds me ever so much of what we did under Nixon during the war on some drugs. Uh, when there was a popular sentiment in the United States uh, for legalization and for less punitive regulation of drugs, what we did is we went overseas through the United Nations and various trading uh, agreements and got all the countries around us to become extremely uh, dictatorial on the subject of drugs and then came back home and said that we, were, we had to be in harmony with all of our trading partners. This is exactly what happened and that's the same thing that's happening now and these trade agreements are being, being negotiated with a lot of arm twisting from a very, econo very important economic power. So, you know, you, you need to be aware of what's actually being done in your name by these trade representatives. Here's a, another question for to Derek. Derek, you're still a Republican, right, even though you don't work for the RSC? I am absolutely a Republican. Just checking, okay. Uh, there, you have the, the new Republican chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Bob Goodlatte, uh, mm -hmm. who has been a friend of Silicon Valley on, uh, going back to the 1990s on encryption. Uh, way out in front of that on that issue, but he's uh, now um, uh, probably Hollywood's uh, closest ally in the House, uh, at least among the Republicans. Uh, he said after, uh, as, as recently as last fall, I remain committed to enacting strong copyright laws. Uh, he did a radio interview with a local Virginia station after uh, uh, weeks after the so SOPA went down in flames, uh, saying uh, that it remains necessary to combat, quote, the theft that's taking place on the internet. Uh, the, he's a true believer. He, his press release when SOPA was introduced, he's an original co-sponsor, was talking about, you know, uh, baby formula and kids dying uh, if you don't uh, pass this law. So you, you have uh, uh, someone who, uh, uh, the outgoing chairman, Lamar Smith, likes SOPA, but maybe um, the new chairman loves SOPA. What's going to happen? Yeah, I have no particular uh, inside knowledge on where he's going to be on some of these issues. But I do think there's a way to articulate these issues in a way that will really resonate with Republicans and conservatives. Um, you made a comment about exorbitant profits. I would actually disagree with you. I have no problem with profits. I would argue that we want to grow the pie for everybody. And our current policies have actually limited the size of the pie. So I want more profits. I want more content. And I see that as pro-artist. And a good example is Jay-Z was being uh, interviewed on NPR Fresh Air about an album called The Grey Album, some of you may, may know, which was a remix of his work and the work of the Beatles. Um, a completely new creation, really terrific piece of art. And he was asked about this because he wasn't compensated for it. And he said, I think this is terrific. This is exactly what we should be doing. So you created an entire new you know, piece of music. And no one would argue that, that you're going to buy the Grey album and not buy the Beatles album and not buy the Jay-Z album because you have them mashed up. But at the same time, a Jay-Z artist may check this out and say, hey, I, I, I thought Beatles were the music my parents listened to, and may go out and buy that Beatles CD. So it actually increases the sales for the artist industry. Now, out, under a rational copyright system, you probably would have had the Beatles, um, you know, the, the licenses for that copyright have already expired. And in that situation, Jay-Z was totally fine with it, but then EMI was not fine with it, the owners of the Beatles copyright. So you have a situation where you're actually having the pie get shrunk. 
And as far as innovation, there's a lot of disruptive innovation industries that just can't flourish because of the policies we have on the books. Disruptive innovation is where economic growth comes from. And a perfect example of that, uh, not to take up too much time, is Google's image search. Before Google image search, it was very difficult to find images across the web. And there are probably a lot of companies that had the idea of searching images. It probably was not the most novel idea. But Google took it on, probably because they had the legal department to take it to court. And they won. You know, they, they were taking somebody else's image and cataloging it, which could have been considered copyright inf infringement, but was found to be fair use. So you have a very high standard to entry for these new industries that only, you know, was it the second lar the largest company in the world was able to take on something of that nature. And you, know, you particularly have examples of artists where uh, they have CDs that are no longer in circulation that may actually want some of their content out there. Uh, I think 90% of Motown records are not available. So if you created those records and no one can legally buy your records, maybe your interests, the interests of your, your, your record producer are actually divergent at this point. And there's a way to increase the pie for everybody and have more content creation, more competition, more innovation. And that's how you can communicate this to a conservative audience. Uh, let me ask, uh, uh, um, open this to anyone on the panel who wants to respond. I mean, uh, may maybe SOAP is dead in, the, in, the, in its uh, existing form. Let's say definitely uh, dead in the existing form. But what, what about uh, uh, backdoor regulation? What about the White House uh, pressuring uh, companies uh, to do uh, SOPA-like uh, things, uh, cu cutting off uh, payment providers? Um, and then you, of course, have uh, the uh, six strikes or X strikes uh, process, the Center for Copyright Information, which is a joint venture between uh, large copyright holders and internet service providers. Uh, uh, there's, I mean, th there's plenty that can happen uh, in the absence of uh, new laws, just uh, this, this informal structure. Anyone want to talk to that? I'll, I'll jump uh, in. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think that it's a, it's a huge concern and we're already seeing that, um, you know, with the, the so-called voluntary agreement, which was you know, probably not as voluntary as, as people are, are claiming just because despite the fact that it was between, you know, ISPs and, and the entertainment industry, you know, it later came out that, that the White House was very, very involved in those discussions. And so when you have that there, there's always the threat that if they don't do this, there is going to be legislation. And I think that that was the, the message that was, was pretty clear. Um, and so, you know, there are there are significant concerns too when you go that path. Um, you know, you don't want to restrict people from doing voluntary things if it's really voluntary. But when it's when it's really pushed on them, you get these agreements where everyone has sort of agreed to do something, and you don't have the same um, uh, review process that that a legislative legislative effort would go through. You don't have the same um, uh, way, sort of checks and balances in terms of how things are happening. And so, as an example of that, with the the six strikes policy, um, there there are some things that may be okay with it, but there are other parts, you know, where the, the when, if you do an appeal, you're limited to certain types of appeals. And one of the things that you're not allowed to list out is that this work is public domain work. That's not uh, an official <laughs> appeal that you could make, and that seems problematic to me. Uh, if you are actually using public domain material, you should be able to use that as a, as a defense. We must have some representatives of uh, uh, some of the companies involved. I, I, I'm uh, actually going to dissent. I'm going to dissent ever so slightly. Oh, that's right. I, you, you folks actually like this. You're an advisor no, no, to this group, I, aren't you? Do I like it? It's, it's well, there. Well, you're an advisor. You didn't an advisor. quit. An, you didn't I, I think quit it's a yet, little too you? early to judge. It's, first of all, it's not six strikes. It, that's kind of been put to bed. It's... It's a graduated response, but nobody gets kicked off, and every single internet service provider will tell you we will not kick off people pursuant to that, uh, to this program. I think you gotta give it a chance. It hasn't launched yet, everybody's waiting. It kinda cracks me up because reporters call me almost weekly and say, why isn't it launched yet? And they're all up in arms. I'm like, you hate this thing, you should be happy. It hasn't launched yet. It's gonna launch eventually, but I think that the jury is still out. Actually, it's Andrew Cuomo really was the one who got this kick-started. I'm not sure the White House had as much involvement as, uh, as Cuomo did, but I think you want to give this one a chance. I have been pushing. I'm on the advisory board t as a consumer advocate, not because I love this thing and I embrace it, but I think there needs to be somebody at least looking out for consumers. And what I've been urging both sides, ISPs and, um, and the content companies, is 
there's a trust deficit here. I mean, you know, nobody trusts either the ISPs or the content companies, and that as a result, you have to be as open and transparent and have as much public participation as possible. So it could work if they were to do that. Now, they're not listening to me quite yet, uh, but I think they're going to have to go there because people are watching what's going to people are going to watch and they are watching what's going to go on with this copyright alert system uh, to the nth degree. So the maximum transparency, the maximum opportunity to defend oneself uh, has, has got to happen. Also, they need to release the data once this thing gets kicked off. How many people got to the, you know, sixth strike and how many people appealed and how many appeals were victorious? They really have to make the data available to see if it really works. Let's open this up. Uh, well, let's let's not focus okay. too much on, on this. Unless you you, you, want, you want five uh, seconds. One, one very, very 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 quick. quick. Okay. In terms of ISPs not cutting people off, we should watch what people in the entertainment industry have said about the the specific wording of the DMCA in terms of the requirement to uh, have a, a a policy that that removes repeat offenders. And it appears that they're implying that ISPs are impacted by well, that. And so, and I, but the ISPs disagree with I, I, I Well, uh, 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 hold on, table. hold on, folks. So, like, at least I got you to stop saying kumbaya, so I'm ha happy <laughs> about that. Uh, ISPs generally reserve the right to disconnect copyright infringers uh, with or without this uh, X strikes policy. Let's open this up to the audience. I mean, I know we have some ISP members out there. We have some Silicon Valley companies out there. We might even have one or two MPARA member companies. Uh, uh, raise your hands. There's some roving mics. I see one roving mic over there. Um, identify yourself, and uh, let, let's let's ask these these folks difficult questions as opposed to, hey, do you like sopa? <laughs> well, only one hand. Okay. Let's let, let's 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 uh, let's see if we rise to the challenge of asking difficult questions of this panel. I don't know if this is like super difficult. My name's Erica. I work for a company called Storyful, and we like use the social web to get news out into the world. We verify media. Um, what are we supposed to do about TPP? Is there a third P? You know, like, what are we, if there's all this legislation going on behind closed doors, as citizens, how are we supposed to A, find out about this, B, understand the implication, and then C, do something about it? We, we over here have a, a two-pronged answer. The way you find out about it, and I, I would say the best, this is self-serving, but the, the best way to find out about it is to continuously check what's going on uh, with it on the EFF website because we are really on top of it. Sir? Well, obviously the biggest problem with TPP is that the negotiations are extremely secret and uh, even even as congressional staff, I, I was personally trying to get copies of the document and we weren't allowed to read it. Only members of Congress are allowed to read it. Almost an in-camera review process. Uh, but. It, the, the opportunity to fight that will be through the Senate where, you know, 34 senators can block a treaty and given the recent history of treaties, there are a number of senators who are inclined against all treaties right now. Uh, so it's a interesting opportunity, which is that you only need a third of the Senate, third plus one, uh, to, to block. Just, just to, uh, th there, there's, whether it's a, a trade agreement or a treaty and in terms of what actually has to, how many senators you need may become trickier. So there's, there is talk of um, making it not considered a treaty. Uh, so Good it's point. Getting, we're getting very down into yes. the weeds, but. But, but. but my, my, my point is, is we should be talking about it now when it's being negotiated, because if it's not taken care of while it's negotiated and while the White House is, is articulating this on our behalf and, and getting other countries to do this and potentially you know, from my perspective, I believe in trade agreements. I like free trade. Potentially losing good free trade items as compensation for this IP stuff. So if you're in another country and you don't like the IP stuff, you say, okay, well, fine, I'll sign on, but will you get rid of this other thing? So it's actually causing us to perhaps have a worse free trade agreement. So now is the time to deal with that because eventually it's going to be thrown down and it's going to be a free trade bill that also has this IP stuff on the side. Yeah, I think it's going to be really hard to stop the TPP in the negotiation yeah. phase, unless we can convince the president that the next U.S. trade representative needs to listen to the tech industry and to the public, in addition to just listening to the content industry. I mean, it's really striking. And I'm, I, you know, look, we do, we do this work. Uh, so for me to say publicly that, you know, USTR has been almost completely unresponsive is somewhat risky, but it's the truth. I feel like I have nothing to lose. So I do think our best bet is going to be if the agreement comes together is trying to stop it in the Senate. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't, you know, keep up on what's going on. We have our own website, tpp.info, that has information about it. 
Um, but I'm not sure at this stage, we were flying all over the world and I th we gave up, we ran out of money. I think EFF is still doing it, you know, trying to get these little science fairs to convince, you know, uh, delegates, trade delegates from around the world to hate the TPP. I don't think it's working all that well. I think our best leverage is going to be, just like Sopa Pippa, is going to be in the Senate when they have to ratify it. I, also, I just think we need to go meta on this. I don't know exactly how long it takes before we can, but I think we're reaching that point where, you know, you drop one more crystal in the solution and it crystallizes. <laughs> the, the, we, we tend to argue an awful lot about whether we want to be fascist in support of a wrong thing or just want to be really darned hard in support of a wrong thing. But we're not really talking about whether or not it makes sense economically. We're not talking about what it, what it was supposed to do in the first place and whether it actually still does it. We're not looking at the economics of the business. And I think until we do that, then trying to enforce it by increasingly draconian means is completely the wrong argument to be having. Okay, let's move on to another question from the audience. Uh, I see a, a few hands up. Uh, maybe um, if you want to go first, uh, you got the mic. Uh, you are? My name is Chris Houston. Uh, I run a company called Surf Easy. We're a supporter of EFF and a big fan. Uh, we provide solutions for mainstream non-tech consumers to encrypt their data traffic and provide online privacy. As all these types of legislations and monitoring and efforts like the six strikes laws and whatnot are efforts increase and consumers start to adopt more solutions to take the matter in their own hands and protect their privacy. What do you see on the horizon for the future of those types of solutions and attacks against that and, and consumer efforts to actually take control of their privacy? Thank you. Anyone? I mean, I, I can, I, I guess I'd like to start the response to that just by saying that that, that is a, that is a, like people taking matters into their own hands is a really, really powerful tool and, and you know, and the people building services to support that, um, people taking those actions is also extremely important. I mean, when it comes to six strikes, m maybe the best way to, 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 you know, to fight six, six strikes is to get a VPN and, and just, you know, because ultimately the, re the thing that's, you know, the thing that's bad about, about some of these, these forms of government and corporate cooperation to, to restrict our freedoms isn't, you know, isn't that, that companies came together to, to you know, decide that, um, that uh, on, a, on a certain enforcement scheme. The problem is that in some markets, we just don't have much consumer choice. Like you can't, you can't decide to, to get a subscription to, to an ISP that respects your privacy, um, for example, in most markets. I mean, in most places, really the only choice for fast internet is your local cable company, and, and most, of, most of those are also content companies. So I think um, some of those services are extremely important. Um, but yeah, of course, as, as they become popular, and hopefully they, they will become very, very popular because they're a powerful way to, to create the kind of market effects we want, right? Where you're, you're the people running, you know, the, the kind of world we want is one where, the, where the, um, the people providing the line to your house is sort of disaggregated from the people deciding what you, can, what you can see on the web because obviously there's a conflict of interest there, an even greater one when they're also a content company. Um, so, so those tools are gonna be extremely powerful and they're very important. Um, and they enjoy a degree of legal protection right now, but of course, once they become a, a big part of the strategic landscape, you know, the way something like uh, file hosting sites did after after peer-to-peer -peer services were shut down, I mean, they're going to start to come under pressure, and and we'll just have to make sure we can draw really clear lines, really bright lines um, around uh, the protection of individual rights and make the case for the values behind uh, the, the the values behind that, and the, the clearest and, and most, you know simple and compelling way to members of the public. Okay, uh, another uh, question. Uh, yes, sir, you have the mic. Uh, I'm, my name is Paul Sweeting. A uh, question for Gigi. Um, you listed quite a number of things that you feel are on the table. Um, that'd be one hell of a bill if you tried to move <laughs> all of that. Uh, wh where do you, could you prioritize that from, from uh, public knowledge's perspective? Where do you think there is actually the most traction that something might happen on that agenda. So I think that, I think the issues that have the most traction, and believe it or not, are t copyright terms. I mean, even, even a copyright maximalist, a strong copyright maximalist is Howard Berman, who now unfortunately is no longer in Congress, said that he thought he made a mistake when he voted for the extension of copyright terms uh, in 1998. Yeah. So I think that's on the table. I think some DMCA reform is on the table. I think statutory damages, I mean, we don't, we don't have a priori priorities. To be quite honest with you, 
anything that would turn back the clock a little bit would be a huge amount of progress. And, I, and nobody's talking about a bill being passed in this Congress. I think the idea is to get the conversation going and again, make the proponents of the relentless march for stronger and longer copyright enforcement, make them explain to the American public why copyright, like Derek said, why do copyright terms have to be 70 years beyond the life of an author? How does that incentivize creation? You know, why should you be able to send copyright notice takedowns under the DMCA willy-nilly, you know, to some mom whose baby is running around on a video to Prince's Let's Go Crazy? You know, why shouldn't there be a punishment if you abuse copyright? Or why shouldn't you be notified when there's DRM on a piece of, uh, on a piece of digital media? That happened to me the other day. I bought Paul McCartney's RAM. Uh, from Amazon and couldn't upload it to any of my computers because it was, it, it was protected by DRM. Why wasn't there a notification? I mean, simple things like that. Let the other side explain why I shouldn't know whether there's DRM on a piece, piece of digital media. Well, I don't think they can easy. make a strong, I don't think they can make strong arguments for any of those things. You're not going to get the Republicans on the panel to sign on to uh, mm -hmm. compelled speech and uh, more labeling, I suspect, but let's, uh, uh, let, let's, let's. Uh, Why not? Okay, any, any Republicans want to oppose this? <laughs> I mean, look, like information half, really. makes the marketplace work better, right? We are talking about making a marketplace, well, a broken have, let's, marketplace work better. Then let's have advocacy groups disclose every penny of every dollar they get from anyone. We I mean, information it. makes the market, come on. Uh, any, 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 any uh, pushback on Gigi's proposal? <laughs> No, but I wanted to add something. Um, in, in addition to the TPP fight, you know, it's not too early to start ramping up for 2018, which may seem like it's a far, far time away, which is when Steamboat Willie will enter the public domain. And that's probably going to be the next time that there's going to be a copyright extension attempt. And it's, it, it's these, often this is how Congress works, is they don't question the status quo, but when things like this come up, that's when they, they talk about it. And that's the appropriate uh, battle line in addition to Daryl Issa's fair use bill, uh, which I think is going to be a really strong thing. But we need to really solidify what we're talking about and how we advertise this. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm against piracy. Uh, but when we talk about takedown requests, perhaps the best illustration of that is how it's already being used to stifle free speech. So it's not just about, you know, debatable uh, fair use violations. Uh, Mitt Romney's campaign. Uh, John McCain's campaign had campaign videos taken down during the election on YouTube because somebody filed a DMCA takedown request. Um, I mean, if, if you don't have a more clear example of stifling free speech than during an actual campaign having campaign videos be taken down on the number one video website on the internet. And the other issue that we should be talking about is orphan works, which is a perfect example of what I'm talking about before of growing the pie. Now, Orphan Works, for those of you who don't follow this 24-7, is essentially when the creator uh, or, or the uh, heir of a copyrighted material effectively can't be found. So as a result, you basically can't sell it. So if uh, there's a CD and you don't know who owns the rights to that CD, then you basically cannot sell it anymore. You can't monetize upon that product. But you would imagine that that author or you know, that singer or author of the book if they had two choices, choice one, your heir won't make any money and no one will ever read your book or listen to your art, your, your uh, song. Or choice two, your heir won't make any money, any money, but they'll, you know, at least your book will be out there. Who would say that they'd be choosing option number one? They, of course, would want their content out there. And Orphan Works are a perfect opportunity to be talking about legitimate fair use reform, uh, sorry, not uh, legitimate copyright reform that's pro-artist. Let's take another question from the audience. Uh, Drew Clark, uh, with, uh, um, very noticeable in that jacket. <laughs> Mike, Mike, a little louder. Broadband Breakfast, a news and events site in Washington, and we're here in Vegas at the Consumer Electronics Show. So let's talk about copyright's impact on business and technological developments. There was just an announcement this morning, ultraviolet, with a, a common DRM for sharing movies in the cloud. I'd be interested in the panelists' reaction to that. Also, uh, about webcasting rates and how the webcasting rates are impacting uh, services like Pandora and others. And, and further, uh, I guess for those who have identified some action items, what, what items would you give up to get improvements that you'd like? I mean, we don't have Hollywood on the panel, but maybe they could be listening in the room and hear what uh, you have to say about that. 
Anyone? I, I never give up before I get into the negotiation. I mean, let me get into the negotiation first before we talk about, you know, what I'm going to give up. But, I mean, there is a bill that was introduced, there was a bill that was introduced in the last Congress, the Internet Radio Fairness Act, uh, which, you know, tries to rationalize radio royalties and make it so we can have more Pandoras. I mean, it's been characterized as a Pandora savior bill, but in my mind, it's more about ensuring that there's more than one major, you know, online radio service. Um, you know, we have some fixes we'd like to make, including making sure that artists get more money. But I think, again, it's a good time to have this conversation about, you know, are radio royalties, are the royalties that services like Pandora and others pay to record companies, are they rational? Uh, do they make sense? Why does cable pay less? Why does a startup, a virtual startup like Pandora have to pay a lot more? Uh, but we do have to make sure that the artists get taken care of. And Orphan Works is important. I think this bill is important for that. I also think we haven't talked about copyright termination and the fact that after 35 years, a lot of artists get to get their copyright back from the record companies. And needless to say, the companies don't want that to happen. So there's going to be a lot of litigation. I know that uh, uh, Representative Conyers, Chairman Conyers, um, Ranking Member Conyers, has been looking at a way to make sure that artists can get their copyright back. I'm sure that's something Hank has something I, to say about. I, speaking as a member of ASCAP, uh, about which I have many, many harsh things to say, I, I would still say that ASCAP comes closer to being a model that's worth investigating for these things than uh, has apparently been used. And the main thing is that we have this golden opportunity now to start the musician business with things like Pandora and Spotify by going direct, by seeing that the artists themselves are paid rather than these organizations that no longer actually serve them. Uh, and I would, I would love to see that happen. It and it would, it would be a very different kind of cut that would be necessary uh, in, order to, in order to really incentivize an artist. Well, let me go, uh, see if I can get you folks back to singing Kumbaya. Uh, you all uh, defeated uh, the SOPA and the Senate version Protect IP a year ago, but I am just checking right now on my trusty iPhone, and the Pirate Bay, uh, now at piratebay.se, is still up and available, and I can list all these wonderful things to download. Uh, there's, uh, first is 20th Century Fox something or other. Uh, there's are, are, are you saying no to any legislation uh, that would render the Pirate Bay uh, and uh, sites like it unreachable? Um, the, the, it's, it's just flat no, uh, even if it's uh, well drafted? Pirate Bay is speech. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you draft a, a well-crafted bill that doesn't have unintended consequences? I, I, and, and secondly, how do you draft, how do you do a well-crafted bill that uh, that the, the folks behind the Pirate Bay can't get around. If you can answer those two questions, then we can answer the original question, but I don't, I don't think that either of those things are possible, and that's, that's the real fear. If you want to deal with piracy, the answer is not to come up with some bill because it doesn't work. It's not that we're pro-piracy, um, well, I'm speaking for myself, so not that I am pro-piracy, but I just recognize that the attempts to pass bills like this don't actually do anything. What does work is focusing on better business models, better services, things that actually get people paid fairly in a reasonable way. And if the industry just put, you know, one-tenth the amount of effort into doing that as they put into trying to get these bills passed, we would live in a very, very different world. I'm hearing no and no. Do I hear a yes, Hank? Well, no, I, I think you're going to hear another no. I mean, why does legislation have to be even an issue? It's like, well, why, why, is, why are we always talking about that as opposed to, you know, just, just listen, if, if I want to sue these guys, I can just go in there and sue them and stop them from doing whatever they want, well, to, providing that I can find them. Right, yeah. Providing that I can find them. And I, and I think that that's, that's, a, that's your remedy. But why, why are we looking at legislation to handle every possible aspect of anything that goes on. I think that that's like, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say too much. Here's Gigi so, with another no. No, I mean, look, I never say, I never say never. I agree with Mike. I'm very dubious that something could be crafted that wouldn't have unintended consequences. 
Look, the fact of the matter is, is that content could have had a bill. It could have had a bill that said that, you know, based, you know, if you go to DOJ, they could go to a, a, the credit card company or the, you know, whatever, whoever provides the money and cut off the money source. They could have had that Agreed. bill. And people would have gone away, you know, relatively, you know, unhappy, happy, whatever. They didn't want it. They want something more blunderbuss than that. So I just don't think legislation is possible. But, and I agree, legislation shouldn't always be the answer. However, if we are going to talk about legislation of any kind, it has to be fact-based, okay? It can't just, it's gotta be based on numbers, it's gotta be based on data, it's gotta be based on real life as opposed to just a lot of hand-waving and rhetoric. And I say that from the kind of things that I'm pushing for as well as what the content industry should pu be pushing for. It should be true of all legislation. I think we've had enough of, you know, piracy costs the industry, you know, a gazillion, trillion, a million, a billion a year. I mean, show, show real numbers, okay? Show real numbers, show a real problem, and show that the, the, the solution that you're crafting is going to address the problem. Is it narrowly tailored to address the problem? I think that's where a lot of, setting aside the numbers, okay, that's where a lot of the legislation fails because it's overbroad, it, it does things that we as a society and we as an economy don't want to happen, uh, and that's the real problem. So you've got to solve those tests before you can push for legislation of any kind. Uh, anyone from the content industry want to push back? Uh, I'm not going to name any names, but I know you're here. I talked to you beforehand. Uh, come on, come on. No? No, okay. Uh, next question in the queue then. Now we have a lawyer for not the content industry. No, that's right. This is Andrew Bridges again. Actually, I just want to come in with a factual point. Uh, Declan, the piratebay.se would not have been covered by SOPA and PIPA. It didn't apply to foreign domains at all. Um, and, and I think that this is one of the things get, that gets lost. At the same time, and this is going back to a discussion that was probably in this room with Sandra A. Stars last year, at the same time, Mega Upload has been prosecuted under existing law. Hotfile has been sued in the United States under existing law, showed up to defend. Rapid Share sued in the United States under existing law, showed up and won. And so the description of the problem to be addressed has never been an honest one. There's just this assumption that there is this problem and we must do something about it without anything to really, anything solid to really back it up. We've got five uh, or so minutes, folks. Uh, uh, there's, uh, you, you, uh, one of you out there must have some tough questions for these folks. There are too many softballs. Come on. No? Okay, I'll take any question. I'm desperate. <laughs> question. Okay. Uh, in regards to keeping the public informed of these bills, I found like a lot of these tech news websites such as CNET and Gadget, The Verge, they cover these stories, but at the same time you find that the editors will do podcasts, videos, how to, of how to get pirated music and stuff. They seem to like brush it under that it's a big problem. So what are your feelings about how it's covering these tech sites are covering these bills, but at the same time, also publishing these videos and how-to articles about how to get pirated music and movies. I don't do how-tos, I do political coverage. Uh, but uh, if uh, anyone else wanna try to respond, TechDirt, you're a, you're a news organization that probably tells people how to download no. pirated software, right? No, we've never done that. We've never done that and we, we, we wouldn't do that. That's really not our, our thing either. So I, I can't defend that specifically. Um, other than what, what I'll say is whether or not those sites, and I, I honestly don't know that those sites did that. I think there, there's at least one, there's, there's a kind of a wacky lawsuit out there that accuses CNET of, of doing that. Um, I don't know about the other sites specifically. Um, but whether or not those sites explain to people how to do that, people, there are ways to find out how to do all those things. And I don't think that you can say that, that you know, people are, infringing on copyright because of this particular story or that particular story. Um, you know, why those sites would do, you know, 
do different, you know, one story that shows you how to get music and one story that's reporting on the bill. You know, I don't, I don't think there's a, a sort of a comprehensive viewpoint that they take. You know, you have different reporters reporting on different things. Um, and they just you know want to write what's interesting to them. Their Besides, hats. there's a whole generation of electronic Hezbollah that have been so pissed off by the content industry that they spread the word uh, with real messianic fervor on how to do these things. I mean, they, you don't need traditional publications to spread the news. No, but uh, Declan, your website over here. Sorry. Oh, there you are. CNET has run reviews and uh, downloads of circumvention tools and all, all sorts of things. You're transferred to the Pentagon papers. So, I mean, I, I, the, fir the First this, Amendment This applies, is journalism. Uh, it's the First Amendment. I mean, I, 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 I don't get that. That, I think, that. I don't condone it, but should a news organization not print these things? I mean... Well, didn't let's, we, let's didn't we print how to build a bomb? And I mean, come on, I, you guys. Just, just, I, let's I let's say a news organization uh, prints something saying how to use a search engine. That can be used for good the and ill. That it never happens on on those websites. That's all. Now, specific I'm examples are useful a instead of whether it should or shouldn't happen. I'm simply challenging the assertion, Mike's assertion, that it doesn't happen. It does. Is I, this going to be the last word, or do we get another question from the audience? <laughs> I, I could to jump be in with neutral the, here, folks. I'm failing. I, I could jump in with a response on that. Actually, a, a second one, maybe that would uh, give some more perspective. I mean, I think, I think it's the case that there are, <laughs> you know, there's there's a small number of people in this room, and I think we we have a point of view that's probably a little bit closer than the vast majority of people on the planet. And there is a very large number of people on the planet who are not who s spend a lot of money, you know, on music and going to the movies and going to shows um, and on art, and who are not entirely convinced yet, um, and maybe they'll never be entirely convinced, that, um, that being able to share a media with other people is a bad thing. And so I think as long as you have a pretty broad consensus of people out there being like kind of still not at the point where they, they really know how they feel about it, they know they spend a ton of money on cable, they know they go to the movies, you know, there's all these studies that show that people who, you know, the more active a uh, participant is in in online sharing of media, whether it's on, on, on YouTube or Twitter or torrent sites or whatever, the more music they buy and the more films they go to see. Um, I think there's, there's a dominant way that people are engaging with culture on the internet. And, and it's a, it includes a mix of, of different types of media, of different types of, um, of ways of accessing things. And I think there isn't, there isn't consensus there yet. And if, if, if we have a country and a world full of, full of people who have not really made up their mind on this yet, it's perfectly natural that they're going to be talking about it and that journalists are going to be writing about it. Um, and I think to think that that would, to think that uh, newspapers would just all of a sudden stop talking about something that basically, at the very least, most people don't agree on. Um, and, and probably most people are kind of, you know, uh, is part of the way that people uh, appreciate and engage with culture. It's just ridiculous. Like, it's, it'd be a form of, um, I mean, it'd be a form of kind of, putting blinders on to, to the reality of, of, of life in a current world, essentially. Uh, Hank, you wanted to? No, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, I want to be part of public enemy. I mean, we can public knowledge or public enemy, we can merge. Can do that. <laughs> well, then let that be the, the last word. It's uh, 3 o'clock, folks. It's time to wrap this up. Uh, I, uh, did, I, I failed uh, in getting a real disagreement, uh, but uh, there, there's a, a, a little bit emerged. Uh, and thank you for your questions. Give these folks a round of applause.